thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone here, and I would particularly like to acknowledge that I am on unceded Algonquin territory. And as uh, um, Emma LaRocque calls it, as a resettler or in this nation, I want to acknowledge my position there. Um, I especially want to acknowledge the, the illustrious panel that I'm on, and what an honor it is for me to be here today. Um, and to have been asked to participate um, in this kickoff session for um, the Indigenous Sovereignty Week. And it's actually, I want to start out with the issue of sovereignty because this is in a way where, um, where Sharon kind of left off her talk because one of the things that sort of has struck me, particularly as a person coming from another colonized territory, is um, how much uh, the how much women are so central to making a nation. And therefore, if you get rid of the women, you get rid of the nation. The moment you start killing women, you actually start killing the nation. So if you start off from that perspective, then a lot of the things that have happened historically fall into place. So if we begin even historically with settlement and the, the whole idea of settling and resettling this land, then one of the interesting things that happened in that process was that initially Aboriginal women were constructed as being uh, midwives, as healers, as uh, um, allies, because they often helped uh, white settlers, basically, to figure out how to navigate the land, how to live with the, within the climate, how to find the resources to survive, but it was when these white settlers wanted the land, and there's been documentation about that, historical documentation, that when land was the issue that was contest contested, that's when, when these representations changed. That's when the squaw made her appearance. So it's really interesting because even there, there's a dichotomy that's already been set up between the squaw on the one hand and Pocahontas on the other. And we all know the story of Pocahontas. The native woman who can be converted to Christianity and who can be used to extend the white nation is the one who will be venerated as the princess. The one who betrays her nation right, is the one who is the one who's saved. So in that regard, if we place it historically, the whole notion of the squaw and the princess had emerged as a counterpoint around this struggle for land. And if you don't have the land, you go after the women. Well, one of the ways that the Canadian state did that was precisely through um, uh, reserves, through uh, schools, through getting the women in and, and training them to be domestic workers, through offering the lure of citizenship to Native men who would fight in Canada's wars to this day. All of these were sort of like tantamount to saying, come and assimilate. And if you assimilate, you will be saved. But if you don't assimilate, then there will be all kinds of ways in which you will be systematically destroyed. So what, to me, we're watching today is actually a genocide. And it's a genocide that has a long history. And it's a genocide that has a history that has so saturated this nation's collective imagination that it's become so taken for granted that we don't even question it. And one of the reasons why it's being taken for granted is because it forms that reservoir of images and stories and knowledge that has constantly circulated and circulated to the point where it's simply been, again, taken for granted. So how have the media done this? Well, I. I'm, and my approach is a very systemic approach. I don't look at the media and say, well, such and such reporter, that's a terrible, although I do have my biases like that. <laughs> I'll confess readily to who I don't like and who I think is a real problem. But generally, the way news media are, are they're basically capitalist enterprises. They're there to make money. And news values are all about you know, values that celebrate the unconventional, that dwell on stories of conflict, and that tantalize and sensationalize different pieces of information. So they are like that. The ways in which stories are told 
there's a routine to that. But within the news media, there are other things that also happen. One is the whole notion of the way in which the news itself is used as, a, as an instrument to legitimize particular ways of seeing the world. That in fact, the news works to basically convey to us and convince us that a certain kind of morality is the way to go. And the news is there as a reflection of the nation self. So basically who we are as Canadians. It kind of defines that for us. And it defines that for us both in relation to the people within the nation as well as the people outside the nation, as in other nations. And within the nation, the news really puts forward, if you start to break it apart, a real hierarchy around race, around who can be mentioned and who can't, around the ways in which they will be talked about. So that brings me to why I started to even look at the issue of Aboriginal representations. I had been looking at war stories and how the Canadian media was reporting the story of the intervention in Afghanistan, and then after that, the, the war in Iraq. And when I started looking at that, I was really, uh, again, the literature corroborates this, shows how much the emphasis was on Afghan women as these um, uh, worthy victims who the Canadian state and the American state had to go out there and rescue. And I thought to myself, particularly during having done the kind of work that I have in social movements and uh, with Viola, that why is it that if everybody can go after Afghan women who are on the other side of the world, why doesn't anybody look in their own backyard? So in other words, what's happening to the women over here? And that's how I started to look at the two groups of women in terms of their representations as worthy and unworthy victims. So what makes, what is the discourse around an unworthy victim? And how is it made possible? So I did do uh, a series of um, uh, studies where I looked at the uh, Globe and Mail's coverage over a seven-year period, from 2001 to 2007. <coughs> I'm trying to find the table that I have over here, but unfortunately, it's not here. In, the, in that period of time, one of the things that happened is that I began to track these stories to say, all right, what are the kinds of themes that they're clustering around? And I had already been looking at the missing and murdered women and done a study of how the coverage had gone into the Vancouver Sun from 2002 till 2007. Here, I wanted to go to the Globe and Mail because the Globe and Mail, despite the fact that it is a terrible paper, uh, and especially after the um, you know, it's still the paper that is there that, that represents us internationally. Yeah? If you go to any Canadian embassy anywhere in the world, the Globe and Mail will be there. The worst thing about papers like the Globe and Mail and the even worse National Post is that our politicians listen to them and record them. And having had the misfortune of once working for the government of Canada, I distinctly remember how much uh, when somebody wrote in the, in, in the paper, the minister immediately responded. But somebody writing a letter did nothing. If you wrote a letter to a particular department to say that they had acted uh, terribly, nothing would happen. But if you wrote an editorial piece in the paper, or you wrote something in the paper, immediately there would be a response. Plus, there was this whole notion of archiving, because papers being so tangible, they are paper, right, can be sorted, can be filed, and you can go back and look historically at how something has transpired, and the kinds of things that it can actually give rise to. So the policy implications become really important. So at that point, I thought, okay, it's obvious I'm going to have to pour over these newspapers. So I started to look at the, the, um, the seven-year period from 2000 to 2007. And when I first looked at it, I thought, well, maybe Aboriginal women are not, uh, are being constructed in this way because there isn't enough coverage. So I went to start to look at the actual coverage. And in the newspaper, there's two kinds of coverage, basically. One is what's called chronicles. They are the short routine stories, you know, 
the, the little blurbs, they're, they're just usually factual. And then there are the stories, these are the features that appear, the columns. So you would think that, okay, if you have features that really detail the story, people would actually know about this and they would be an uprising. And I had with me in an online newspaper uh, about the missing and murdered women, women in Vancouver, and I had started the column by saying that if 500 Canadian soldiers had died in Afghanistan, what do you think the outcome would be? They would be an uproar across the country. How is it that 500 Aboriginal women or more have gone missing and many are murdered and there is nothing? At which point I got all of this hate mail sent to me by people who thought that I was being very unkind to the military forces <laughs> that were apparently protecting the nation. <laughs> At any rate, when I started to go back and I thought, no, obviously it's not because they were a lot of short stories. There were a lot of chronicles and there were a lot of features about Aboriginal women. So clearly it wasn't the amount of coverage. What it was was the kind of coverage. So as I went into looking at the kind of coverage, these particular sort of thematic clusters showed up for me. One was something that Sharon McIver has already mentioned, the drug addicted sex trade worker. That was the looming category, okay, an iconic figure. The second one was the inept mother, and there were tons of stories about custody cases that continually showed how these women were unfit mothers, which then allowed the state to go in there and take the children. The third thing was that these women, and Aboriginal people in general, suffer from chronic bad health. So chronic diseases, it was rampant, and it was really interesting to see how even those organizations that, that are progressive organizations, by putting forward statistical ident you know, identifiers and profiles saying that Aboriginal women suffer from two times or three times the level of uh, uh, the rates of cancer as, as, as the ordinary Canadian population. By itself, such a story could make sense and would sort of, can be used as leverage to get material and resources into that community. But if you take that story and start to fix it and glue it to this prototype that's being built, then you start to see this profile of a race that is basically <coughs> doomed to extinction because it's diseased, it's chronically ill. Then the third thing that would come up was that Aboriginal women were too fertile. They were having too many children, and they really didn't know how to practice birth control. And then, you know, having too many children, they were inept mothers. So what are you going to do about a situation like that? And then the only, the other sort of like prototype that emerged was the Aboriginal woman as an itinerant wanderer, that she basically moved from place to place, and therefore it was impossible to keep track of her and, and, and have some kind of accountability of systems built around her. There was only one representation that would, I would say veered towards the positive, and that was the idea of Aboriginal women as acting out. But again, this was constructed, because now you're building a profile, it was constructed as them being too militant. So if they asked for money, it was always they were demanding money. If they asked for change, they were not satisfied with what they had. And so these were the kinds of constructions that were laid out. When you start to put these constructions together, you get the profile of a womanhood that is basically, you know, either it needs to be salvaged and rescued, but of course it's not going to be because they're culpable. They're responsible for their own fate. Or a group of women who have deliberately put themselves into harm's way, who are exposing them to, themselves to all kinds of sickness, who cannot look after themselves, so the state has to look after them, and who basically are, are responsible, you know? So this is the construction that begins to appear. Now, what makes the situation worse is that the way in which the news media work is they tend to, be, to have a very, um, uh, limited focus. So they focus on stories that are abstracted 
from the larger context, right? So there, these are decontextualized. But in the process of being decontextualized, they become like retail pieces of information. So they're abstracted from a, a larger context, which is never mentioned, and then they're given piecemeal, one at a time. They're episodic in coverage. So you never get the batter that's appearing until you start to look at a track, like seven years worth. And then you see, okay, there's definitely something going on here. And why is it going on? What is happening with, with this pattern that's emerging? So on the one hand, you've got these sort of like non this episodic kind of coverage, which is punctured coverage, one at a time, which is retail. And then you've got the translation of structural violence, which is the violence that's done by the state and state-imposed violence that's been converted into an individualistic focus. So rather than, like the story of, of Shannon and Maisie, rather than saying, oh, this is part of a pattern, and if it's part of a pattern, why is the pattern existing? The story becomes one about Shannon individually and Maisie individually, and what were these women like, and what were they doing at that particular time, and as young women, of course, they're going to fit into the itinerant mode, you know, they're always on the move. They've gone away somewhere, as not really being responsible and so forth. So that's the kind of discourse that now gets constructed around Aboriginal women. Okay. So, given that I don't have very much time, how do how does one deal with this? Because the media are a very powerful institution, and yes, they are connected to the state in so many ways. But how do we, at the grassroots level, begin to counter this? Well, one way of countering it is like posters like that. Aboriginal women are loved and valued. Small, but it's very significant because it turns the message around. But the second way is, as, as Sharon was saying, launching, particularly at the state level, demanding not just an inquiry, but making this at an international level, and this, this is being done before by Aboriginal women, it's a, it's a strategy of shaming, where you bring this up, the notion of crimes <coughs> against Aboriginal women in terms of crimes <coughs> against humanity. So the discourse changes completely. Mm -hmm. You're now no longer talking about missing and murdered women, you're talking about it at another level, and you're changing the language. And when you change the language, you actually change the conception of it. Mm -hmm. This is a trick that I learned you wouldn't believe it from the Republicans in the U.S. <laughs> they're the ones who started talking about, and you remember global warming? We were all talking about global warming. Well, they changed that to climate change, right? So now they talk about climate change. And the, and, and the estate tax, when they wanted to get rid of that, they started to call it the death tax. So nobody wanted to pay the death tax. And so as a result, you know, they lost I mean, they won the battle to have the death tax erased. So here, we need, to be, we need to be mindful of the kind of language that's used. How do we change this around to a way in which it hits everybody? And it hits at a level where you're not just shaming a nation, but you're also calling into question its very notions of morality. And the third thing is that we demand and I think this is where we can do something. There is an organization in the US that's been doing interesting work. It's called the Op-Ed Project. And what they do is they come in and they actually do workshops with communities to write op uh, opinion pieces. You get an opinion piece in and you get more and more opinion pieces in. But more than that, it's those little letters, you know, that nobody, we never take the time to, to do but that a lot of racists do take the time to write, you know? So again, okay, it's like we need to be really careful about the strategies that are being used on the right and on the other side. How do we take advantage of them? We begin to write in and say, all right, why isn't there more coverage? Why is it we, we demand not only more coverage, but we also demand a contextualized coverage. We want the history there. We don't want episodic coverage. This is a pattern. We want you to focus on the pattern. What are the kinds of things that are going on? 
you know, that render and that make this group of women basically construct that in the media discourse as not only worthless as victims, but also as disposable bodies, you know? And the cry should be that no body is disposable. Not one, not 500, not a thousand, yeah? So it's taking that thing, that whole language and debate yet to another level. I'm gonna stop there, I could keep on talking, but I won't because it's already nine o'clock and we've been told that there should be a Q&A period. So I'm going to leave it open for questions and answers. Thank you.